This is one of those great math memes with a very simple premise. The premise is unexpected and unnecessary formality. On the left, the unexpected formality manifests as Winnie the Pooh in increasingly regal dress, finishing with a monocle, a mustache, and a stylish bowler cap. On the right, we have complicated ways of referring to the first counting number, where the final way is Legendre's constant. And I as an empath care deeply that you understand this meme, so I'm going to explain to you all three of Winnie the Pooh's outfits. Uh, actually, maybe it's more important that I explain these three things on the right. L let's start there. Beginning, of course, with the top, the simplest way to refer to the first counting number. It's a single stroke, occasionally with some additional flair, and sometimes called the loneliest number. Lone, bone, stone, three, two, this number, of course, is own. 33, 22, if we put a pair of these bad boys together, we get own t own. Ah, uh, but of course, as you know, it's not quite so simple. Indeed, these days, this number is actually pronounced one, and hence this number is 1t1. Yes, one, as lonely as it is, is a lovely number. It's the number that precedes two, and the number that happens to describe the quantity of Texas edition holographic Larson Algebra 1 textbooks that I have. Yeah, I'd say this is number one in my book. No doubt you understand what one is. It is the simple and plain way to refer to this number. It's how the common folk do it. But if you're going to a swanky math holiday party and you're permitted a plus one, you certainly don't want to refer to the plus one that way. Better it would be to say you're bringing a plus multiplicative identity. What does that mean? Mean. Well, the phrase multiplicative identity describes one because we could take any number, A, multiply it by one on the right or on the left, and the identity of A is unchanged. One times A, A times one, it's all the same, it's just A. This is true no matter what A is, even if A is nine, this works. Since multiplication by one doesn't change a number's identity, one earns this special title of multiplicative identity. Indeed, you could pass a whole afternoon by yourself just bearing witness to one's awesome power. One times one, that's one. Zero times one, that's zero. As the old saying goes, to multiply a number by one, just write the number and you're done. I mean done. As a fun bonus term, which isn't as much of a mouthful as multiplicative identity, but which does surpass it in its simplistic poeticism, sometimes the multiplicative identity is referred to simply as unity. Now you may think one is the only number that has this property, so why on earth would we need such a special term to refer to it? Well, you mustn't take our beloved lonely number for granted. I'm sure we are all familiar with doing mathematics with the integers. These are the numbers with no fractional part, like negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, and so on. Doing addition and multiplication with the integers is a very pleasant thing. The integers have all sorts of great properties with these operations. For example, commutativity, the order of addition, and the order of multiplication doesn't matter. There's also the property of closure. If we add any two integers, or multiply any two integers, it's closed. We stay within the integers. It's not possible, and not desirable, to leave this friendly set of numbers. Not only do we have our beloved multiplicative identity, unity, the number one, but we also have an additive identity, zero. We can add zero to anything and it doesn't change, even nine. Yes, there's so much to love about them, I could just burst. But imagine if we only had the even integers. The even integers. What sort of shady characters live in this set? Well, these are numbers like negative four, negative two, zero, two, four, and so on in both directions. All those numbers which are multiples of two. Although we don't have any of those odd numbers in this set, 
and importantly, we don't have the number one, this set still satisfies so many of those great properties with addition and multiplication. Indeed, this set of even integers satisfies commutativity for both addition and multiplication. Just writing out what this means for addition, the order of addition doesn't matter. A plus B, that's the same as B plus A for any two even integers, A and B. The set of even integers also satisfies associativity for both multiplication and addition. This means, put simply, that grouping symbols won't change the value of an expression. Writing that out with addition, it means a plus parentheses b plus c is the same as parentheses a plus b plus c for any three even integers a, b, and c. These two properties should be obvious. It's just an inherent fact that addition and multiplication of real numbers works this way, whether we're only looking at even numbers or all the numbers. Other important properties can't be taken for granted though. For example, the property of closure. If we add two odd numbers like five and five, we get 10, a number that isn't odd. However, the set of even integers doesn't have that problem. If we add two even numbers, a and b, the result is even. This is because even numbers have to be multiples of two. So if you add two of them together, you'll just get some other multiple of two. And of course, the same is true for multiplication. The product a times b of two even numbers, a and b, is even. When we're considering the addition and multiplication of even numbers, we also have the familiar distributive property. This tells us how multiplication interacts with addition. A times times b plus c is equal to a times b plus a times c. Multiplication distributes across the addition. This is true for all real numbers, so of course it's true for the evens. But then finally, do we have an identity in the even integers? Well, yes, we do have an identity. We have an additive identity, zero. We have this number that we can add to any other without changing it, but we don't have such a number for one. We don't have a multiplicative identity in this set. However, because the set of even integers satisfies all of these properties, even though it doesn't have a multiplicative identity, it's what we call a ring. A ring is a set of objects, in this case the even numbers, endowed with two operations called addition and multiplication that satisfy these properties. In our case, addition and multiplication were commutative, but in general to be a ring, it's only addition that needs to be commutative. Both operations, though, do need to be associative. But here again, those words I used, a ring is a set of objects endowed with two operations called addition and multiplication. All sorts of things can be a ring. This is a fairly familiar example because it's a ring of numbers and the operations are familiar addition and multiplication. But we could also have a ring of functions where the operations are function addition and function multiplication. We could have rings of sets, rings of polynomials, rings of matrices. They're all a collection of objects that with the right pair of operations behave very much much like our familiar set of integers with our familiar and beloved set of basic algebraic properties. Now I should mention some authors will insist it's not a ring unless it has a multiplicative identity, which may or may not be one depending on what the ring is. If we have a ring of matrices, for example, the multiplicative identity would be what we normally call the identity matrix. Regardless though, call it a ring, don't call it a ring, the point is there are interesting algebraic structures worth studying that don't have a one to call their own. That's why not only is one called the multiplicative identity, but it is an honorable and noble title to wear. And at last, Legendre's constant. To explain what Legendre's constant is and why it refers to one, of course, like any cool math discussion, it begins with pi. Before we see what pi has to do with this though, I must remind you that this video is brought to you by Mathshin. That's my math fashion brand. You can go to mathshin.com, link in the description, and pick up some of the coolest math clothes ever created. For example, this is the optimal packing pullover. It's a super comfortable sweater that shows the optimal way to pack 17 squares into a larger containing square. 
We've got lots of other really cool products and designs like the pigeonhole principle design, Tomei's function, and more. So check it out and pick up something swanky. Now of course, pie is a very important thing. Probably my favorite food is cherry pie. It's also the 16th letter of the Greek alphabet. As a Greek numeral, pie expresses the value 80. And of course, most importantly, pie is used to denote what we call the prime counting function. Plug a real number X into this bad boy and it outputs the number of primes less than or equal to that X value. For example, what is pi of 10? Well, the prime numbers less than or equal to 10 are 2, 3, 5, and 7. Thus, pi of 10 is equal to 4. There are four prime numbers, numbers only divisible by 1 and themselves, which are less than or equal to 10. As another example, pi of 100 happens to equal 25. There are 25 prime numbers less than or equal to 100. Of course, mathematicians care deeply about prime numbers, and so, too, care deeply about the prime counting function. But since primes are so mysterious, the function that counts them is as well, and mathematicians would love a great way to approximate values of the prime counting function. I know what pi of 10 is because I can just count the primes one by one, same with pi of 100, but I don't have any nice formula for finding what pi of x is for any given x value. The French mathematician Adrien Marie Legendre <laughs> was interested in this prime counting function. And so in 1798, he offered up a conjecture for approximating this function. X divided by A log X minus B, where A and B are constants, and this is the natural log function. Legendre supposed that for very large values of X, this may be a very good approximation for the prime counting function. But he warned the exact determination of what A and B should be to optimize this approximation would take the finest analysts. Like I said, this conjecture was made in 1798 and it was written in one of his books, but in 1808 he released the second edition of the book in which he had settled on some values for A and B. A he had concluded was equal to one and it's B that would come to be known as Legendre's constant. And in that 1808 second edition, he had an approximation of B as about 1.08366. He did not assert this as a final value for B, but just a conjectured value. So at this point, we're still not sure what B is, but A is settled, and so Legendre's conjecture here is written as this, where of course A is one and so does not need to be written, and this notation is just a more specific type of approximation notation. It means that the prime counting function is approximated by this function, and in particular, the relative error of the approximation approaches zero. So for very, very large x, this would be a pretty good approximation. Now, some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, if we just ignore the b, isn't this exactly the prime number theorem? And yes, it is, but the prime number theorem wasn't proven yet. The prime number theorem was proven in 1896, so this predates that. Furthermore, this statement, like the prime number theorem, is about asymptotic behavior, that the relative error of this approximation to this function approaches zero. However, Legendre's conjecture was specifically about finding a value b to maximize the accuracy of this approximation. It doesn't matter what B is, in the long run, B will be small relative to the other numbers, so the asymptotic behavior of this function is not affected by B. However, it still does affect the accuracy for any given value of X. So keep in mind, because the prime number theorem hadn't yet been proven, the whole idea of this approximation at all, not just the B, was still up in the air. Anyways, if we treat this for a moment like an equation and do some basic algebra to solve for B, multiply both both sides by the denominator, divide everything by pi of x, move the log x over, and negate everything, we find that b, if it exists, 
would have to equal the limit as x goes to infinity of log x minus x divided by pi of x. Of course, we have x going to infinity since this is a statement about asymptotic behavior, also sometimes called long-term or end behavior. And based on prime number tables at the time, Legendre had good reason to believe in his approximation of about 1.08366. Just look at this plot, for example. What we see here in red is this function, whose limit at infinity is the value of b, if it exists, and it appears that this red function is approaching this horizontal line. This blue horizontal line is that approximation Legendre gave for his constant, 1.08366. So that was in 1808, but then in 1849, Russian mathematician Pafnudi Shebyshev proved Legendre wrong. Remember that it wasn't even known at the time if b existed. It wasn't known if this limit existed. But Shebyshev proved that if b does exist, it must in fact equal the multiplicative identity 1. So this didn't settle the issue of finding the value of Legendre's constant, except to say that if it does have a value, it must be 1. Finally though, about a half century later, in 1896, Charles Poussin put the nail in the coffin. In 1896, he proved the prime number theorem, often abbreviated PNT. That theorem states that the value of the prime counting function is well approximated by x over log x. The relative error of this approximation approaches zero. Another way to think of it is the ratio of this approximation to the prime counting function approaches one. Now Charles Poussin having the prime number theorem under his belt coming back to the issue of Legendre's constant was like a shonen protagonist returning after a training arc and it was easy for him to prove as a corollary to the prime number theorem that indeed Legendre's constant b is equal to one. And so in one fell swoop, he pretty much made Legendre's constant an irrelevant term. And indeed going back to the graph, it looked like Legendre's approximation was a pretty good guess, but something weird happens if we zoom out. This goes up to x equals 100,000, but look at this same graph that goes to x equals 10 million. You can see that red function, whose limiting value is the definition of b, actually starts descending, and it turns out it's approaching 1. Some people will use the term Legendre's constant to refer to that initial approximation he made in 1808, but it's important to note that's not technically correct. Legendre's constant is 1. So that's just a quick explanation of this funny little meme I found on Reddit. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut and untuck the table If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal Wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm jaded Hate the odds that I calculated Press and pull and pray and push it all the way through the whole blue planet Faded Psychosomatic habits, why you so, so